Alright, so here's a selection from Mein Kampf. So it was decided that I should go to, to high school. From my whole nature and to an even greater degree from my temperament, my father believed he could draw the inference that the humanistic gymnasium would represent a conflict with my talents. A real school seemed to him more suitable. In his opinion, he was especially strengthened by my obvious aptitude for drawing, a subject which in his opinion was neglected in the Austrian gymnasiums. Another factor may have been his own laborious career, which made humanistic study seem impractical in his eyes and therefore less desirable. It was thus basic, uh, his basic opinion and intention that, like himself, his son would and must become a civil servant. So uh, this is um, Adolf Hitler's father who's saying, you must be a civil servant or I'll beat the shit out of you. It was only natural that the hardships of his youth should enhance his subsequent achievement in his eyes, particularly since it resulted exclusively from his own energy and iron diligence. It was the pride of the self-made man which made him want his son to rise to the same position in life, or of course even higher if possible, especially since by his own industrials industrious life he thought he would be able to facilitate his child's development so greatly. It was simply inconceivable to him that I might reject what had become the con content of his whole life. Subsequently my father's decision was simple, def definite and clear in his own eyes. I mean of course finally a whole lifetime spent in the bitter struggle for existence had given him a domineering nature and it would have seemed intolerable to him to leave the final decision in such matters to an in inexperienced boy having as yet no sense of responsibility. Moreover, this would have seemed a sinful and reprehensible weakness in the exercise of his proper parental authority and responsibility for the future life of his child, and as such, absolutely incompatible with his concept of duty. And yet things would have turned out differently. Then, barely 11 years old, I was forced into opposition for the first time in my life, hard and determined as my father might be in putting through plans and purposes once conceived, his son was just as persistent and recalcitrant uh, in rejecting an idea which appealed to him not at all, or in any case very little. It, I did not want to become a civil servant. So, Hitler wants to become a painter. I want to be a painter, Dad. And then, like, uh, Al Alois, Alois, A-L-O-I-S, Hitler, he says, no, absolutely not. You're going to be a civil servant just like me. So we're starting to see sort of a, um, a friction between father and son there with uh, Hitler um, and his father. He's sitting there saying that his father had a, he was stubborn, but he himself was stubborn too. Um, but eventually his father beats the shit out of him, so his stubbornness would lead to violence and shit. And then he would try to, um, he kept the idea in his head, but in, in school he did shitty in school, thinking that if he failed out of school, then he would have to be able to be allowed to go to, to an artist school. Um, you know, that was his thinking. So, the, um, you know, the jealousy of the German culture and German nationalism, it was a big thing in, in both World War One and World War Two. World War Two, Germany represented the cultural peak of Western scientific civilization. So, they had, you know, all the science and all the technology, and Germany was poised to be able to take over the world once more time. And Churchill was scared. He was saying he was fighting for all humanity when it comes to World War Two. So it wasn't just fighting against Germany, it was fighting for all humanity, because once uh, UK went down, once Britain went down, then we would all be goose-stepping, right? We'd all be, mind, you know, volunteering for new jobs, and then goose-stepping, which, I don't know if you've seen, like, way people goose-step and shit, but it's like, where you just kind of, like, put up your legs. Right, that's goose-stepping. <laughs> And um, and that's that's the way that they had marched. I see today that's how the uh, um, the people in North Korea they said so there's there's goose stepping that's going on in North Korea today. Um, yeah. Okay. So, what event plunged Europe into World War One? This would have been the um, the assassination of the Archduke Francis Ferdinand. So, the main cause for World War I, which began in Central Europe in, in late July 1914, included many factors such as the conflicts and hostility between the great European powers of the four decades leading up to war. You had militarism, alliances, imperialism, nationalism, so militarism, right? Uh, just, just a bunch of people could script in a bunch of kids and they're all fighting and shit. Alliances, so allies, you're my buddy, you're my buddy, imperialism. Um, people wanting to expand their states and nationalism. You know, we're all Italians or we're all Serbs or we're all French. 
That's uh, those those played major roles into it. The immediate origins of the war lay in the decisions taken by statesmen and generals during the July crisis of 1914. And the July crisis of 1914 was caused by the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand and his wife Sophie by Gavrilo Princip, an irredentist Serb and member of the Serbian National Organization, the Black Hand. The crisis came after a long and difficult series of diplomatic clashes between the great powers, Italy, France, Germany, Britain, Austria, Hungary, and Russia over European and colonial issues in the decade before 1914 that had left tensions high. In turn, these diplomatic clashes can be traced to changes in the balance of power in Europe since 1867. The more immediate cause for the war was tensions over territory in the Balkans. Austria, Hungary competed with Serbia and Russia for territory and influence in the region and they pulled the rest of the great powers into conflict through their various alliances and treaties. Some of the most important long-term or structural causes were the growth of nationalism across Europe, unresolved territorial disputes, an intricate system of alliances, perceived breakdown of the balance of power in Europe, convoluted and fragmented governments, the arms races of the previous decades, previous military planning, imperial and colonial, colonial rivalry for wealth, power and prestige, and economic and military rivalry in industry and trade. E.g. the pig war. war. So there's a war, a pig war between Austria, Hungary, and Serbia, and other causes. So the pig war, <laughs> since I'm already talking about it, the uh, the pig war. This is in Serbia. The customs war or pig war was an economic conflict between the Habsburg Empire and the Kingdom of Serbia in 1906 to 1909, in which the Habsburg, uh, Habsburgs imposed a customs blockade on Serbian pork. So we're not going to buy no more Serbian pigs. There's going to be a customs um, uh, blockade. No more pork coming from Serbia, the Habsburg says. And, you know, that's that's the pig war. So that's, you know, that the uh, assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand starts this crisis in 1914, the July crisis of 1914, and then all the decisions of all these great powers then leads to World War One. So because of that assassination, that uh, basically plunged, you know, that, that's what starts the entire unraveling, you know, I guess, so to speak, of, of order that had happened back then. The, um, we talked about Hugo Boss, who designed Nazi, Nazi clothes and his huge uh, multi-corporation uh, uh, entity today. I also want to mention Fanta. Fanta was, uh, is a Coke product. So during 1941 and 1945, Coca-Cola wasn't able to get any of their products into Germany because there was an embargo. And so the Coca-Cola company in Germany started making Coca-Cola with different products, and they made Fanta. So here's the Wikipedia. It's a global brand of fruit-flavored carbonated soft drinks created by the Coca-Cola company. There's over 100 flavors worldwide. The drink originated, originated in Germany in 1941. In UK, Fanta has a rival to Tango, made by the British company Britvic History. Fanta originated as a result of difficulties importing Coca-Cola syrup into Nazi Germany during World War II due to a trade embargo. To circumvent this, Keith, Max Keith, the head of Coca-Cola Deutschland, Coca-Cola GmbH, during the Second World, War, Second World War decided to create a new product for the German market using only ingredients available in Germany at the time, including whey and pomace. The leftovers of the leftovers, as Keith later recalled. The name would, was the result of a brief brainstorming session, which started with Keith exhorting his team to use their imagination, fantasy in German, to which one of his salesmen, Joe Nip, uh, Knip, immediately retorted, Fanta. While the plant was effectively cut off from the Coca-Cola headquarters during the war, Plant management did not join the Nazi party. After the war, the Coca-Cola Corporation regained control of the plant formula and the trademarks to the new Fanta product, as well as the plant profits made during the war. So Coca-Cola was able to make all that money. They wasn't able to sell Coca-Cola to the poor German soldiers. Um, they could sell it to the American soldiers. So, you know, Coke is making a shit ton of money off this war, and they're making some money through Fanta um, with the Nazi, through the Nazi party. The um, the last question actually that uh, like two videos ago is which I didn't mention. So the the, um, the what were the reasons that Woodrow Wilson got into World War One? So why did America get into World War One? In uh, April 6, 1970, that's when he decides to jump in. Why did we do this? You know what's the point of this? And uh, there's three reasons I wrote down: the Zimmerman Telegraph, 
the Belgium atrocities, and the sinking of the RMS Lusitania in 1915. So Lusitania, which was a ship that was coming from New York to um, UK, it was known that there were German U-boats and there was a blockade that was going on. Germany and Britain are sitting there having this naval battle. Uh, Britain is saying that Germany can't use any of the seas. German, Germany has, you know, coastline, and so they want to be able to use the seas, but since Britain's not allowing them to, Germany creates these submarines, um, these U-boats, uh, which goes under, under, under the water, and then they're able to blow up all these different ships. So there was an ad in the paper for the RMS Lusitania that was going to leave New York and go to um, Great Britain, and it was known that it was possible that German U-boats could have sunk it, so the fact that it was a big surprise is bullshit, but there were Americans that were on board the Lusitania, and so there, you know, people were saying we need to, we need to uh, d jump into World War One. You know, it needs to be. And actually, Teddy Roosevelt, who says war is the health of America, he's all talking about yeah, kill, kill, kill. As soon as he heard Lus Lusitania, he just wanted, you know, just kill everybody who gives a fuck. Uh, the Zimmerman, the Zimmerman note was um, the the uh, I don't know. It's a guy that I, I forget actually where the who it's named after, uh, the Zimmerman Telegram. So the Zimmerman Telegram, it's there's a deal that's supposed to happen in a German that talks to Mexico, says, Mexico, why don't you invade America? Because if you invade America, then we'll give you some of the lost territory that you had received. If you invade America, America is demolished, and you can get back the land that you lost with the Mexican-American War with James Polk. And um, so Zimmerman Telegram, it was a 1917 diplomatic proposal from the German empire for Mexico to join the central powers. So this is Germany asking Mexico uh, to join the central powers and you'll be able to gain the land that you had lost during the Mexican War. Um, and so it was, the proposal was intercepted, decoded by British intelligence, revelation of the contents, outraged American public opinion, and helped generate support for the American uh, declaration of war on, in, on Germany in April of that year. So it, they find out about this note in April of the year, and then boom, they declare war. So the Zimmerman note definitely helped them. The sinking of the Lusitania happened in 1915, so that was two years beforehand. Um, so it didn't get them right into it, but it did, um, you know, uh, enrage Americans, and so it was kind of used against them. There was also the news of atrocities in Belgium in 1914. So you had the atrocities... Um, that happened in Belgium, then you had the sinking of the RMS Lusitania, and then you had the Zimmerman uh, telegram. So those are the, the two immediate ones right before the Zimmerman telegram, the rape of Belgium. That's what they call it. It's a, the usual historical term regarding the treatment of civilians during the 1914-18 German invasion and occupation of Belgium. So Germany invades Belgium. The term initially had a propaganda use, but recently his, uh, historiography confirms its reality. One modern author uses it more narrowly to describe a series of German war crimes in the opening months of the war. The neutrality of Belgium had been guaranteed by the Treaty of London, which had been signed by Prussia. However, the German Schleifen Plan required that German armed forces violate Belgium's neutrality in order to outflank the French army concentrated in eastern France. The German Chancellor Theobald von Bethmann Hallweg dismissed the Treaty of 1839 as a scrap of paper. Throughout the beginning of the war, the German uh, army engaged in numerous atrocities against the civilian population of Belgium and destruction of civilian property. 6,000 Belgians were killed, 25,000 homes and other buildings, and 837 communities destroyed. 1.5 million Belgians fled from the invading German army. So that's 20% of the population off, all left. Um, so just how many Belgians were still on the run within their own country is not known. Estimates vary between 0.5 and even 1.5 million. So that's um, 14 minutes. Shit. Um, I guess we can go to answering the questions now. So the questions that I got, who was the secret police for the Nazis? What company did uh, Coke employ to sell Coke products in Nazi Germany since they couldn't get their syrup into it? What did young Hitler want to do? Um, this one you won't even know, but uh, G uh, Germany was the Third Reich. Who was the first and who was the second? And then number five, who takes power after the fall of the German monarchy? So the first question, the secret police for the Nazis is the Gestapo. The uh, company that Koch used to sell Coke products in Germany was Fanta. Young Hitler, he wanted to be a painter. His dad wanted him to be a civil service person. The first Reich was the Holy Roman Empire. The second Reich is Otto von Bismarck, and then Hitler would have been the third Reich. 
and then who takes power after the fall of the German monarchy. This is with the first president of Germany, of the German Republic. Uh, it's a social democrat called Frederick Ebert. He's the first president of Nazi Germany. Or not, of, of, <laughs> of free democratic Germany. So he is a German politician of the Social Democratic Party of Germany. First president from 1919 until his death in office in 1925. So it's Friedrich Ebert.